Uh, first off, I'm Anna Hågren, and I will start to excuse my English. I'm from Sweden, and nowadays I don't use English daily uh, uh, in my normal life or in my job. So it will be like low level English. <laughs> and if you don't understand me, please tell me. Uh, I'm a social worker from the beginning. Uh, I'm also a, a sex educator uh, and also a sexologist. And when I was young, my mom was a political person in my country. She also has NM. And she was doing a lot of disability work in my country to get better uh, life for people with disability. And I decided back then, I will never, ever, ever in my whole life work with disability issues. I was so fed up with everything that I had with disabilities uh, issues to do. Uh, due to that, I, I, myself as a young person, I had to go to the physiotherapist, to the speech therapist. I had welcome. I had to go and do, uh, you know, swim. <laughs> Thank you. And so I was really fed up and decided never ever to work with disability issues. But then when I, on my summer holidays as a social worker student, I had become um, a leader of uh, a camp leader for disabled children. And I started to get interested in the lives because back then, my NM was very, very mild. So I never really felt that I had a disability. And I always felt that I was like, I was too uh, strong to not have a disability or a muscle disease, but I was too weak to be well, a normal person. And I, I'm, I don't know the proper words on English, so you have to excuse when I'm uh, using the words. Uh, but so I was always somewhere between, but I felt more home with people without disabilities than I felt with people with disabilities, because they always were more sick than I was or had more issues. But when I started at the camps, I realized that the children there who uh, also were born with them, they were acting in a way that made me afraid of what will happen when they get older. They were very pampered and also about their bodies were kind of uh, belonged to someone else because a lot of those children at the camps had spina bifida. And with spina bifida, you need, uh, when you go pee pee, you, you don't do it on the toilet. You need, I don't know the proper word, but you need a straw to put in your private part so you can go potty or to use diapers. And, and for me, when I saw that all these young children, uh, they asked, you know, if we helped them taking the clothes off, both girls and, and boys in the age of eight or younger and even older, they were like kind of spread the legs up and it was like, welcome. And they didn't care it was a man or a woman, who, wh whoever, because they were still used to. People were actually taking care of their private parts. And that for me as a social work student, what will happen to them when they are grown up? Because that was not a world that I, who had MM, was used to. Because I was able to go to the bathroom, the toilets and all those things myself. And when I was educated as a young teen or a young girl, I got the same education as people without a disability. So I had the boundaries that we are supposed to learn. And, and therefore, yeah, that's the whole story about me. So therefore uh, I got into this question. Uh, and now my daughter is doing what I did to my mom, but uh, 
you know, <laughs> where she's fed up with all a disability talk back home and issues. Uh, but hopefully she will follow one day in my footsteps. Oops, doesn't, nothing happens. So when a born, uh, when a child is born uh, without any uh, physical disability or mental disability, the first year they, they are looking for safety and nearness they are sensing with the, both with the hands, with the mouth. They are kind of, you know, looking for what's going on in the world. And they are, are yeah, they just need to be safe and uh, be close to us parents. And they are, uh, yeah, yeah, just uh, getting the feeling of what life is. Then this, uh, the age between three, one and three, I think there's some, if they don't have a disability, this is the most amazing age. Uh, you can see that they actually start to be a person of their own. Uh, usually uh, between these years, they are starting to speak. Uh, first some words, and then they can put it together to sentences. Uh, they are, start actually to do things by themselves. They put on shoes by themselves, clothes by themselves. Uh, and they <clears throat> even can talk back to you by themselves, uh, even if you don't want to. And they try to find their independence. And at this age, if you don't, they don't have a disability, uh, they all also start to go into the toilet by themselves. We do potty train them, uh, but a lot of times, and this is so funny, uh, I have friends and even, even my own daughter, she was so happy the first time she actually did the number two in the potty. It was so important for her. She actually had diapers for a very, very long time, but the first time she was managed to do number two, two in the toilet. Uh, she wanted me to take a photo of it and because it was so important for her because that was something she could she did by herself she was able to do this all by herself not with you know not with help from me or her father so that was really really good and so this is an age where they really try to find themselves and uh a little bit of uh, start to feel independent. Yeah, these are the most, uh, these are the years that are more, more challenging. Uh, the child uh, can, they, they now know who they are. Uh, they try more to do things by themselves. They have a lot of temper sometimes, and they really want to. Uh, be you know doing things that others does, uh, and they kind of uh, how should I say they uh, they yeah they are very independent at this age, and uh, and they, as I said they know what they want to do and they are yeah active, very active, and a lot of. Children, they now go to preschool to meet other children. They can start to compare themselves with each other. Uh, and, you know, and when they do compare themselves to each other, they find more finding out who am I compared to this person and that person. And uh, these are the years that nothing really, really happens <laughs> normally. Uh, I usually say it's like a, a bridge to the teens. Of course, things happen, but uh, I mean, they have built up everything, and these are the years that just things going on. A lot of things. I mean, things. Not, I mean, things happen. So these are school years. Of course, things happen, but they are not much developing years in, in the same sense. Uh, but so, but they are starting to get interested in other things in life and 
and they are uh, really curious in things also. Uh, who am I? I mean, a preteen, they think a lot. Who am I? Why am I? Is there a God? Is there not a God? And if there's a, you know, if there's a God, why am I this way? And why is someone else in the other way? And so, and at these years, they also start to hide things from us parents, uh, with or without a disability, because they start to talk with their friends about it. And these are the years they don't talk to us at all. Uh, they start to live their own life if they don't have a disability. For girls, there's a menstruation. And uh, for boys, uh, it, you know, they get night e ejaculation. Uh, they start to be grown-ups. Things are happening in your body that they sometimes don't know what's going on. And sometimes it's scary. Uh, and between these years, it's, it's like they want to get away from parents. And at the same time, they don't, you know, it's like a Jojo. Uh, they want some freedom and want to be independent. Uh, and at the same time, they're kind of coming back, but because they need their safety. And they, at the same time, they are not grown ups yet. Uh, so, and please feel free to ask questions during the time. But if you're born with a disability, things are not exactly the same. And uh, even if it's a mild disability or a severe disability, these things we all go through. Uh, when a child is born with a disability, the first, uh, the first time is to horrify. We don't know what's, uh, why is, if I take my family for an example, uh, myself due to my NM, uh, I wasn't awake during, uh, uh, I had a C-section and I wasn't awake. Uh, uh, I was, uh, uh, I had anesthesia, but we have films, uh, Wilma's dad, they, they took Wilma out and the first thing and this was our firstborn, so we had no clue. So the, fir the first thing they do is, you know, pull her out from my stomach and they just ran with her across to another section of the hospital. And actually, <laughs> he thought, okay, this is what they do. <laughs> you know, they take the baby and they ran away. And he was kind of following them with the camera. It's like, yay, wow, you know? And he didn't realize that she wasn't breathing. Uh, I was happily sleeping and had no idea what was going on. But when he followed them into the ICU and they put on her the uh, CPAP, then his world just collapsed. Uh, and it, it, we have a, uh, at, that, at the same time she was at ICU, uh, they were supposed to take. I was intubate, intubated with a tube and uh, they wanted to take the tube out of me because it was not so good to have the tube in for many hours. And they called him and they tried to locate him. They called him at the ward, they called him at the ICU and they didn't, they didn't get a hold of him. It took them six hours to get a hold of him because I didn't take, want to take the tube out if he didn't hold my hand because I was afraid of taking, I've done that a couple of times and it's not fun at all. And when he finally got up, I, I'm like, I was kind of ticked off. So I wrote to him, where have you been? And he goes, yeah, Anna, it's probably Anna. She didn't breathe. There's something wrong with her. And if they, they told us that it might be Anna, but it might also be that she's one month early. Uh, but they don't know yet. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't give up. Mm -hmm. Where were you? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you know, Anna, you was always been up here. You're down here now. 
now Wilma is up here. And from that day, he has always been overprotective. And at the same time, I mean, he was a, he's been a great father exercising her and everything. But that was like, and I think it was for him who saw her from the beginning, for him, uh, overprotecting was an instinct immediately. For me, I saw her without the CPAP. So for me, it's like, no, 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 no worries. She will handle it, she will manage. Don't be a fuss, you know? Uh, but at the same time, it, it, of course we have to be protective or we should be protective of all our children, but not the word overprotective because that will hold them back always. Uh, when they get older, uh, the thing that happens mostly with us parents, we help them too much. Uh, they don't, we don't uh, expect them to do things by themselves. Uh, and in our minds, we kind of tell ourselves, no, they can't because of, or, oh, I should do it because of. It's better if I don't let her do that so she will have energy for that. Uh, as we heard on the panel, the children, I mean, the, the young adults or the, the teens that were talking about how they have to, you know, moderate their energy. As a parent, uh, I had to do that when Will one was young. Uh, but at the same time, as, uh, when, when we have to do this in this age, I think it's important to think, okay, it, she needs to socialize today and tomorrow we can just have a rest day instead of saying no to everything uh, because it's gonna hurt them in the long run. And also they, since, uh, as I wrote here, negative experience of their own body. They will real, start to realize uh, that their body doesn't function as other young uh, children's body functions. Uh, they even, I mean, even uh, they're gonna see other kids if they go to preschool or, or whatever, and, or daycare, that someone, else, someone can stand up and I can't. Someone needs help and I, uh, uh, I need help and someone else can't. And at this time, uh, they actually do start to get a negative experience of the body. They will feel unsure. Uh, and also probably alone because we don't have so many NMs in the area where we live and they might not have anyone to compare with. Uh, and at this age, what also usually happens, we don't challenge them enough. Uh, and they also realize when, I mean, not when they are three, but maybe when they are six, that they are kind of linked to us parents for life. I remember my, well, my herself, <laughs> uh, her dad and I, we spoke to her already when she was five about moving out, <laughs> you know, finding, you know, your first apartment, you know, doing as your, not sibling, but what your cousin does. And at a year of five, she goes, no, that's not gonna happen to me. I'm gonna need your help, mom and dad, the rest of my life. And for me, being a Swede who has a real good social welfare system, I mean, she's gonna be okay the day she moves. Uh, I know that, 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 I mean, that's not a question. But for me as a parent, hearing that from my five-year-old year old, and we have a really good social, I mean, she's gonna get a PA if she needs that the day she moves away from home. So that's not a real issue. But hearing that from a five-year-old that she actually are thinking about those things already, uh, it hurts. 
and we'll talk about what we can do, but this is what's going on when you do have a disability as a child. And, and you can also, I mean, when Wilma, I usually take my, my family as a, uh, examples. And when Wilma was, uh, I think it was five uh, also, and she went to kindergarten because both her dad and I went to work and they were playing uh, police, ambulance, and injured people and fire department. And they were playing that on the uh, uh, kindergarten area. And Wilma said, yeah, I can join but I can't be the fire department because on the three wheels uh, bikes, she couldn't, you know, she couldn't handle those. Uh, but she was always the injured person. And at the same time, it's really sad because we talked about at home. Yeah, you might not be able to be a police and, you know, but you're going to be able one day to drive a car, you know? Uh, so because she thought that her life was always going to be the person who was injured uh, because she was, she was, uh, uh, she was checking out herself, comparing to what the others could be. And at this age, also, they start to have those. Uh, it's like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Uh, and uh, I mean, then you have that. I, I wanted to be an NFL player when I was young. I was four years old, putting on my socks and, and going on the floor back home. And, 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 and I, I, I wanted to be a kind of, uh, uh, yeah, a hockey player when I was young. But of course, that was a dream. But then as a child, I also wanted to be a hairdresser. And that was actually, that was out of the question because my arms are not strong enough. Uh, but here they start to realize what they can't do instead of what dream can, what kind of dream can be true. You know what I mean? And um, so on. And the children also in this age, they start to realize that they have a, a vagina or a, a pee pee. And uh, also, what I said in the beginning, since they need so much help from others, then uh, at this time, they, they hide with the person from another sex to say that, what do you have in your pants? And what do I have? And they only have a look. And, uh, and children who are able to go and hide, they can do that. It's quite innocent. They just look, oh, it's like, uh, uh, it's like, oh, you have a US port and I have a US, yeah, USB, you know, it's very innocent. Uh, and nothing really sexual happens because they are not sexual persons yet, but they want to know about the bodies, you know, and oh, you also have a butt. Oh, I have a butt, even if I'm a male and you are a female. But if you have a disability and you can't walk by yourself and go and hide, you are not going to figure this out. Uh, so they are also going to be left out of the sexual uh, identification. And on this age, they started to, uh, yeah, again, sexual events. They are hold outside those because you can't move around by themselves. And unfortunately, they are very dependent on parents uh, in this age. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're from the United States or if they're from Europe or even Scandinavia, who has a great, great uh, PA system with personal systems. Uh, but they are very much hold out of experience. And they really start to be very intellectual uh, but it's also often sometimes hold out uh, once again i take my own daughter as an example uh, we are now planning your new high and we've done that for a year and as wilma said today that she will have a 
that has an extra person in the class instead of having her own personal aide. Uh, she will have an, they're just going to have an extra person instead of just one teacher. They will have two teachers in the classroom all the time. Uh, and that person will help. It's like a teacher's aide who will help her with things, um, but also will help out with if there's someone else with uh, uh, some issues in the class. Uh, but when I met this uh, aide, she was more used to working with people who had autism and don't want to go to school because they don't like to social interact. And when we had a, uh, we met her at our home and she was introducing herself and so on. And the only thing she was focusing on was, yeah, I'm going to help you to feel good in school, Wilma. I'm going to make sure you want to go to school. And I'm like, got really upset because that's not the issue. She's going to go to school. She's going to be happy in school. Uh, it's going to work. But it's not that that's our concern. I'm concerned about the food she will have so she can eat properly. I'm concerned about the elevators that she will have friends with her when she needs to use the elevator. Uh, I'm concerned about the outings when we go on field trips. Not that she's going to be happy or not. She's going to be, she's a teenager here. She's going to argue me with me every morning going to school or not. So that's not the thing. If she's happy or not, she's going to school, end of question. You know, it's more that will it work physically in school? That's my issue. Um, and so it, it's, um, and also, as Wilma said today, she don't know if they will be friends with her. Because, and that kind of hurts me because she's hiding, she has been hiding this from me. <laughs> I found out today. And um, as she said, that if they're friends with her because she's in a wheelchair and it's more fun, well, we have a really nice amusement park really close where we live. And when you go on the rides, you can go several times in a row. And everybody wants to go with Wilma because you go in a line that goes faster because there are no, no stairs. And they ask you, are you satisfied or what, do you want to go again? And everybody says, go again, you know? And as she said, she doesn't know if you're friends with her because of her or if it's nice to be friends with her because she's in a wheelchair that time. So often you become the mascot. You become the founder person. My husband was actually, uh, my ex-husband was asked when we, when we were younger, uh, isn't it hard to, you know, stay together with someone with MM? And his answer was, no, we had a lot of toys back home. You know, I had a scooter and I had two, two wheelchairs and, and so on. I mean, he just made a joke about it. But at the same time, somewhere that's kind of for our teens, it's kind of a real thing, you know? And Wilma has also said that the day she forgot her wheelchair and didn't bring it to school, um, they treated her different. No one held the door. No one asked her if she needed any help because they didn't see the disability. But when she comes to a wheelchair, she said, everybody are nice, you know? And uh, as a parent, I'm, I'm like, okay, that's fine that they're nice. And I said, yeah, but that's good that they don't see you disability all the time. But that's not the way our team sees it. And at this puberty phase, sometimes they don't know a way and don't find a way to, you know, find their own way of life because they know they're independent, they are dependent on us. And unfortunately, they remain to be in children. They are just old children. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, the last thing, since I'm a sexologist also, uh, that what worries me a lot, that the body is full of unsolved sexuality. And that's what I'm afraid of, what will happen when they get older again. Uh, that people will take advantage of them 
because they are very interesting. I mean, uh, of, of what's going on. I mean, even though you are in a wheelchair or any kind of disability, uh, and I'm sorry, I know we are in America now, but as a Swede, it's so easy for me to talk about this. Uh, but we are born as a sexual creatures and we die as sexual creatures. That's life, that's how it is. And uh, we even as a parent, I don't know, I don't want to know about what's going on in my daughter's head or in, in my, my nephew's head about sexuality. But I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, and I think it's, uh, we, as a parent with a child with disability, we can't just ignore that. We have to have that with us because other, other teens, they get the information so easily today and now we don't. Uh, and maybe your team needs to get help to open a computer uh, just to you know, be able to browse on a, a porn page. Other teens without disability, they, do the, they can do it anywhere and hide everything. Uh, I had a dad when I was working as a counselor at the habilitation center, he called me up and said, Anna, I have an issue. I have two boys who are you know, 18 and I never really you know, had a sex talk. We did a little, but I know they know everything. And I found the magazines because this was before all the Wi-Fi. And I found the magazines and I found the toilet paper, you know. <laughs> But my son, I know he needs help, but it feels so wrong going out and helping buying a magazine of nude girls. What should I do? You know, and I'm not, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what answer I gave him, but this is an issue, though. Yes, I mean. I never said that something is right or something is wrong. It's up to everybody. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna tell her what he did. I told him, go out and buy one, <laughs> <laughs> but let him choose which one. Uh, uh, but it's so important so, because they can't compare themselves with others, you know? And, uh, they, they, if, if you, uh, yeah, they, they can compare with the others in the same way because most of the friends don't have the disabilities. And this is the thing that teens talk about. And even if, yeah, even if I'm as a sec, uh, social uh, worker and a sexologist, uh, I don't want to talk with my daughter about it and so on because that's, you know, that's family. But that's something as I as the parents that really need to start with early, very early. Since you need always have been needed help in the bathroom. But what can we do to change all this negativity? Uh, this is actually a Wilma in the little hat. Uh, this is at the hospital. And that's my best friend, Katja. Uh, even though you are afraid, uh, I didn't even let my parents hold her the first days. Uh, uh, but, and she had a feeding tube uh, at the hospital. And she also had an acne machine on her that peep, beeped all the time because she stopped breathing at the hospital continuously. Because let others hold your child. Let the child feel that this is someone else holding me. And it's okay, even if you're scared to death. Because both that, uh, and, and it's, it's both ways, both for your child and for yourself. I've seen parents, uh, actually, when the kids are in the 30s and the parents are very old back th by then, they start to worry. Who's going to help my child now? And they have never ever 
and let anyone else help them in the bathroom, help them get dressed or help them with anything. Uh, and then the child don't want anyone else to help them. And then who's gonna help them one day, you know? And even if you try to say no, because it's, it feels more safe with you as a parent. I'm the same. Uh, when I was in, uh, I went to hospital in, in Australia and I was really, really sick. That's why my lungs are so weak today. I was on the, uh, I went to school in Australia and got real, real sick there. The only one, uh, and my brother came over because I was actually dying over there. And my brother came over to be with me for the last time, uh, as we thought. Uh, the only one I wanted to help me at the hospital was my brother because it felt more safe. It was family, even though he saw me totally naked and we were both adults. I, I, we told the nurses, this is not usual in Sweden either. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even if it's my brother now when we're adults, he don't see me naked. This is uh, you know, a very special time. Uh, but I, the only one uh, that uh, was allowed to take care of me or help me switch moves in the bed was my brother because it felt safe, it felt family. And I mean, they had nurses and doctors in Australia too, you know, even if it was down under for me. And, and because I was so used to, when I grow, was growing up, to have my parents or my brother helping me out. So, you know, exercise or not, maybe not the right word, but try to let others help your kid with stuff growing up and don't help too much. Ulrika is on the left with Wilma there. This is on a competition, running competition in our small town. And Ulrika, who was my PA at that time, and we have cobblestone in Sweden, way too much. <laughs> so uh, it's real hard to get around. So I wasn't able to push Wilma myself so Rika does that. And this is a no, this is actually for kids that run. But I said, you're gonna go on this competition because it's uh, you have to attend. And the first, I mean the first 50 centimeters, she was pushing herself. Because I said the other kids are used to their legs by themselves. And you have to use your arms by yourself and then Ulrika can push you. And of course, when they started out and the kids were running, I mean, they were, they took off and Wilma was there, you know, wasn't, you know, didn't really move much, but then she was in the front <laughs> in the end because Ulrika was running her legs off. Uh, so, you know, let the try, try and try and try. Myself, I was raised by uh, as I said uh, today at the panel, I had my mom who has NM also. And in my family, uh, we weren't allowed to say, I can't. Uh, we were only allowed, uh, that was not two words in Sweden or, or on Swedish. Because it was always, have you tried? My parents were really hard on me on, uh, you have to find your own way. And I'm thankful for that today. Otherwise, I don't think I would sit here either today. Uh, I, I'm like a cat. I, I guess I have nine lives, actually. Uh, but that has made me uh, uh, strong in my mind uh, and that I dare to do something. Uh, but they have always said, I'll be there for you. Just try and I'll help you out. Yeah, and when they start to be of the age of uh, four to six, try new things every day and challenge them. Uh, today, I can't fold uh, linen. I can't fold sheets anymore. I can't make my bed by myself anymore. So a PA helps me out with that. But if, if I didn't, I'm the one taking the picture on the right side. If I didn't show, uh, or tell by mouth how to do it, Wilma wouldn't learn how to do it. Uh, 
uh, now she had she at that day she was able to use her arms but today uh, we talk about i mean she's turning 13 in, now in the summer and we talk, we're already talking about starting to get a car and by books we we look how do you do when you change your tire uh, as me i don't i know how to do it up here and i have no strength of doing it physically so i can actually grab any man or a girl i want to say can you help me and they go oh, i have no clue i do so challenge your children to learn things even if they are not able to do it by themselves physically because and i and my ex-husband he taught me this when we were uh, we were going on a cruise and he he he's been working on ships and he showed me you know the, those boats if they if it's like titanic it goes under and you go on those uh, rescue boats and i'm like i said no i'm just going to go to the bar and take vodka because i'm going to drown anyway and i want to drown drunk because i won't feel anything then and he's like nah that's not a good idea Anna. And he said, he, he told me, so we went around and he said, this is the way you're going to reuse them because he knew uh, since he worked on chips. And uh, he said, there's going to be a lot of drunk people who's going to be strong and no of them going to know how to get them down. But you are, and you're going to tell them, and that's the way you're going to be alive, Anna. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Okay, oh, well, I, I, then I can just, you know, push my, my drunk theory, I can just throw it away uh, and I can actually uh, manage and hopefully stay alive. And also try to be in a, in a common context. Uh, we've tried, I think, every kind of music instrument that you can do in a Swedish music school. Uh, she started out as a four-year-old playing the violin. Uh, she actually had, uh, the teacher was crying the day we said, she won't do this anymore because it's too hard. Uh, they tried to have her to sit down in her wheelchair playing. Usually you stand up when you play the violin, but holding her arm up was way too hard. Okay, cello, you sit down all the time and the arm is lower. Mm. After a while, you have to put it back and forth, back and forth. So that was not a good idea either. Then we tried the guitar, you know. Uh, today, she, uh, she has switched to art. Because art, you can put on the table and you can draw. But what I mean with a common context is because there she will meet friends or hopefully friends will actually communicate with others that don't have a disability which is important our children normally don't have uh, issue with their minds and if we don't put them in the context uh, with people who without disabilities they finally actually going to be uh, disabled in a social way and I've seen this when people, when parents put their uh, kids with spina bifida together with uh, children who have mentally uh, who are mentally challenged, uh, uh, because the the sports are uh, in anyway in Sweden the, the the sports we have more sports for people with, who are mentally challenged. So parents are putting their physical able, non-able children within those sports. And after a couple of years, their children actually start to show uh, kind of, uh, how do I say? They, they kind of start to show that they are like to have mental impair impairment, you know, because they don't get challenged with the minds. Uh, and for me, myself having and um, I think that's really sad. It's not that I'm saying that one group is better than another. It's absolutely not that. But I think it's very important to remember 
uh, most of our children don't have any issues with the intellect. And they, if, as we don't have the strength in our bodies, we need to have the strength in our intellect. One of my friends in Sweden, he has SMA and he works for Google. Do you know what uh, Spotify is? You know when you press a button on your phone so you can choose what music you not want? He's the guy behind the guys. There's two guys that invented Spotify, but they needed a smart guy doing that. So when you press on the bottom, that actually the music comes. That's my friend who invented that. And he can't even scratch his nose by himself. So that's how important I think it is to explore our minds, because then we actually will have a job when we get adults. Or we, I am old now, but you know, your children will have jobs when they grow up. It doesn't matter how weak they are, but if we have challenged their minds and challenged the way of living, they're gonna be just fine when they grow up. And it's also, I think the time is really running. Oh yeah. And just a few more minutes, please. Just speak normal with your children. Don't baby talk them. Mo many of our children have issues with talking. And if we say tootsies instead of feet or foot, they, that's not the right word. And it's a horse, it's not a, well, well, or whatever, you know, it's use the right words. My daughter didn't speak until when she was six years old. Now she's like me, she never stops. Uh, and uh, the things they can do, let them do that. Well, I get allowance once a month, but she needs to do things at home. Now she doesn't have siblings or another had, but her cousin also had to do work at home to get allowance, but moderated in their way. You know, maybe just that she can take out the trash, but uh, your daily, daily thing will be to switch off the lights in the hallway when you get to bed. That you can do, and that's what you get the allowance for. You know, so that it uh, challenged them. And in that way, it doesn't matter if it's the trash or if it's the, the switch on the lamp, it's that they actually doing something and do uh, uh, as other kids doing something more heavy. You understand what I'm, yeah. Uh, and when I, I talked earlier about the children that they were very proud and they, go pooping and it's like do number two because that's something they can control as a child uh, I mean if children there's two things children can really control eating and pooping and that's nothing we can do about if they don't want to eat I mean we can put in a tube by the nose but that's something they start knowing that they control can control when they are around the age of three and that's why it's so important if they use diapers when they're growing up, uh, show them, you were a good girl, you were a good boy, you did number two. Because if you only swipe the poop away from the bottom and, and, and throw the diaper away, they don't need, not even gonna know that they did number two. And that number two is a process in growing up. I did something by myself. I have the power to do this by myself. Thank you so very much for listening to me. And here's my email. Uh, I have a web page, but it's on Swedish, unfortunately. But you can always contact me uh, on my email, and I will always answer uh, if you have any more questions or if you want to Skype or have be in contact or whatever. Uh, uh, I have another speech at two. 30, I think it is. So I'll be around. Uh, but just ask me and I'll try to help out. Oh, thank you.